So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming today. And uh, hopefully some more folks will join us, but if not, we, this is definitely recorded. So you'll wanna be making sure you pass it on to your friends. I'm Carolyn Merrick, a program coordinator here at the center. And today we have with us Bev McCoy. Bev has been a runner and uh, Charlottesville resident for um, quite a while. She's been here since 1957 and she's gonna share with us her journey with running and marathon history and women's place and all of that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bev, and thank you very much. All right, thank you all for having me here. This is a gorgeous building. I had not been in it, so delighted for the excuse to be here. Uh, I will just start by saying my talk will start with the history of running leading up to the marathon. We will learn of its inclusion in the 1896 Olympic Games the first in the modern era, the Boston and the New York marathons, the struggle of women to be recognized as runners. I will compare the young years of two of America's champion marathoners. The Ethiopians and Kenyans are the force in marathons now. Indispersed will be a few personal stories. What is a marathon? <clears throat> the distance covered is 26 miles, 385 yards or in kilometers, 42.195 kilometers. That would be a drive from your center here up Route 29 to Ruckersville and back. That's your 26 miles or approximately 104 times around a track at a high school. But when was that distance set for the road race and why that distance? What was the history behind it? Let's start way back. In 2500 BC, women were, not, were encouraged to run, but to improve their reproductive capabilities. But by 776, they were not allowed to run or even watch running competitions. And of course, men who were hunters and gatherers probably ran from attacking animals. The Greeks' longest races were five kilometers or 3.1 miles on cinder tracks in stadiums. There was much pushing and shoving. That 5K distance is still popular today. Next slide then. But what is the history of the marathon name? In between 490 BC, there was in, in 490 BC, there was the battle of marathon between the Persians and the Greeks. King Darius I of Persia sought to conquer Greece. The triumph of the Greeks with a much smaller force was announced in Athens by a runner of messengers. The question on Jeopardy just a few weeks ago was, where did the runner start? He ran from the plains of Marathon to Athens, famously collapsing saying, rejoice, we conquer. Or some reports say he gasped, Nike as he died from exhaustion. And he doesn't look good, in good shape right there. Pheodipides was his name. It is Pheodipides shown in this painting. The defeat of the Persians is said to have been followed by the rise of the classical Greek civilization, a pivotal moment in Mediterranean and European history. The first modern marathon length was about 24 and a half miles. For the London Games in 1904, the royal family requested the marathon begin at Windsor Castle so they might see the start. That previous distance, 24 and a half miles, was the distance they figured that Theodipides had run. The marathoners entered the royal entrance to the White City Stadium and ran a lap finishing in front of the royal box. That distance became the official distance of 26 miles, 385 yards. There are longer races now, such as the Western 100s. Longer races are often called ultras or ultra marathons. Let's go on to a better, happier slide now. From 900 BC, no, 900 until 1960, entrance for a marathon were given a fitness test. 
1958, three runners failed the test, but ran anyway, finishing in the top 10. Being fit, they probably had very low pulse rates. In their case, it was not a sign of illness, just excellent health. The modern revival of the Olympic Games was to be held in Athens in 1896. The organizers decided to include the marathon. Baron Pierre de Coupadin, who founded these games, as well as the Greeks, were most pleased by the suggestion of holding the games in Athens. Of course, only men were included in the marathon. To the Greeks' delight, the winner was Spiris Lewis, a Greek water carrier. His time was two hours and 58 minutes, which is very respectable. Now the time record for men is two hours and one minute, almost an hour faster than Spiros. Before I go too far, let's get a bit educated about keeping runners' times. Originally, the person first across the finish line was declared the winner, and then the stopwatch was used. When was it invented? Who knows? Many are given credit, but let's say it was invented, invented about 200 years ago. One can find pictures of a row of men with their watches watching the finish line, ready to punch the timer. They would compare their time shown on the watches and declare the winner and his time. Next would come runner's bibs with a tear off sheet at the bottom. These sheets were kept in order of finish. Finally, a more accurate system was devised. Plastic chips about the size of a quarter were tied through one's shoelaces. And now there is a chip embedded in the runner's bibs. One runs over a mat at the start of the race and more mats about every five kilometers apart through the finish. The number of each runner and their time is recorded. This method ensures that runners have indeed run the whole race. In 1980, the Boston Marathon, in the Boston Marathon, Rosie Ruiz jumped into the marathon close to the finish. She was declared the runner for about a week. Uh, it was the true runner was Jacqueline Grosso, who I think was a Canadian. And then she was crowned. All right, can we go to the next slide, please? Going from a few runners to tens of thousands. These, this slide shows the start of the New York Marathon from Staten Island over the Verrazano Bridge and going through the other four boroughs of New York City. The race is always finished at the Tavern on the Green in Central Park. The first race had 100, uh, 127 competitors, all men. This is 1970, the 55 finished. The race consisted of four loops just in Central Park. The New York Marathon is now the biggest there is with 53,000 running in 2019. The entrants came from 120 countries. The average age of the runners was 41. The finishing average time was four hours and 37 minutes. Now 42% of the finishers are women. When Hurricane Sandy struck New York, the race was canceled as it was in 2020 due to COVID-19. What about the New York Marathon? Four of us had decided in 1982, it would be exciting to run, but we had to enter the lottery to get a race number. As my brother John lived in New York City, we gave him our entry forms. He was amused as he headed to the post office to put the envelopes in the mail at midnight, the earliest date and time allowed. John said it was really weird to see so many people at midnight heading to the post office with envelopes in hand. Johnny and we four were all given numbers. The runners are bussed very early in the morning to the staging area on Staten Island. We spent about four hours waiting for the race to start. It was a beautiful but cold day. The start is staggered with the elite, that is the fastest runners, starting first. The thousands of us were shepherded towards the starting line, and finally, we're running. Our actual start time was recorded with the chip. 
At first, we spent really cut quite a few minutes walking, blocked by the thousands of runners ahead. Soon we started over the Verrazano Bridge, which bounced as we ran over it. The railings were strewn with discarded clothing, which we had worn to keep warm in the 50 degree weather. Incidentally, the clothing is picked up, cleaned and distributed to the needy. Once off the bridge, we headed through the other four boroughs of New York. The roar of the crowd is deafening as they line the avenues 10 deep. So exhilarating, such great crowds and excitement. We were so pleased with ourselves, we wore our medals, finishers medals prominently on the plane ride home. Some say to be a real marathoner, you have to have run two mission accomplished, Richmond, which I will mention later, and New York. Greta Weisser, Norwegian, was the first woman to complete the marathon in less than two and a half hours. In the first New York marathon, she was only known for her success at running track. She was thought to be a rabbit in the race. So the runners let her go. They just figured that the rabbit would drop off the course and she would fail. Their mistake to let Greta go. She was not caught. She, she won in total nine New York City marathons. In 1992, Greta ran very slowly with Fred LeBeau, who originated the idea of the New York City Marathon. At this time, he was very ill with cancer and had never run the race, only directed. The crowds were thrilled to see him. He finished in about five hours. Greta said it was the hardest race she, she ran, going so slowly and perhaps the most emotional. Just this past September 13th, there was a front page article in the New York Daily News that caught my eye. I've never read that paper before. The headline said he's 80 and going on 26.2. The runner, a retired New York City fireman, was the winner of the first New York City Marathon exactly 50 years ago to the day. He still runs weekly in Central Park with a group of buddies enjoying the training even running the hills, he looked in fabulous shape. Next slide, please. How does one train for a 26.2 mile race? You run at hours for hours at different speeds, do hill repeats, which I found very beneficial. For the hill repeats, you run up short hills fast and return down slowly to catch your breath, then up and down and up and down. On most runs, we friends chatted along the way. The rule of thumb for recreational runners is to be able to talk while you run. Ladies have changed from chatting over the coffee, over coffee at the kitchen table to chatting while running. We solve problems while we run. Solutions pop into your head unsolicited. Friend Connie and I once were really complaining about our mothers who were driving us crazy. After 12 miles, we decided that's the way it was, and so what? We loved them anyway, despite their faults. To increase your speed, you can run what are called strides. You alternate running 20 seconds fast with 40 slow, or as it is known, recovery. I like doing what is a ladder, run 400 meters fast, followed by 200 meters recovery, then 800 fast with 400 meters recovery, and then, uh, where we go, and then 800 fast with 400 meters recovery and a mile fast, a mile recovery. Now you ladder back down by running 800 with 400 recovery, finish, finishing with 400 meters. There are many systems to increase speed. Also weekly, you run farther, for distance on Saturday, and then take Sunday off. Rest days are most important. Obviously, elite runners' training schedules are far more arduous, and they factor in naps and eating more. Nice bonus. Other recognized benefits of running are lowering the risk of lung, prostate, and colon cancer, also depression, hostility, and generally negative feelings can be alleviate, alleviated. 
If you have watched any of the major races, you probably saw a group of Ethiopians and Kenyans leading for most of the race. Their men have the fastest winning times for all but one of the past 25 years of marathons. All but five of the fastest women runners are from Ethiopia or Kenyan. Why are they so fast? Many have tried to emulate their training schedules, but seldom achieve their fastest times. These runners often live and train at altitudes of seven to 9,000 feet above sea level. Their bodies adjust to the low oxygen so that when they are at much lower altitudes, their bodily functions are more efficient. Their blood carries more oxygen. To get a full explanation of the benefits of altitude training, ask one of your doctor friends. The statistics just prove running at altitude works. Run like a girl. And the next slide, please. But how about women in road races and the games? Women are such fragile people that the distance they were permitted to run was very short. In 1929, the president of the International Olympic Committee wrote, Engage, engaging in strenuous physical activity has many adverse effects on women. Competition makes a woman, quote, overly assertive and bold and ruins the beauty of the feminine physique by eliminating her soft curves through strengthening her arms, broadening her shoulders, narrowing her waist, adding bulk to her legs and developing power in the trunk, all characteristics that could render a woman overly masculine and unattractive. Baron de Coupadin did not favor women in competition. He believed that the primary measure of a woman is the number and quality of the offspring she produces. Women were not permitted to run more than 200 meters in the Olympic track races. In 1928, the race distance was finally lengthened to all of 800 meters. Remember, that's twice around a track. One lady collapsed at the finish. She actually was diving for the tape to break it first. The others looked exhausted. A terrible and frightening spectacle. Was the condition of the men noted as they finished? No, they looked pretty awful also. To protect the health of the poor ladies, the 800 meter distance was banned for them until 1972, when it and 1500 meter races were run. There is written that Stamata Raviti in 1896 ran the full marathon distance. Gradually more women ran in races, but even in 1960, uh, oh, 60s, a Smith College runner was not even allowed to run in a five mile Thanksgiving day race. In 1966, Bobby Gibb wanted to run the Boston Marathon, but it was still deemed that women were incapable of running the 26 plus miles. Again, it was thought that they would suffer permanent damage, would not have healthy pregnancies, look too masculine and just not re attractive a reoccurring theme. Do you remember the very slight Norwegian champion, Ingrid Christensen? She ran a marathon with, while five months pregnant, no problems. Arlene Pepper officially completed a marathon in the United States, running the Pikes Peak Marathon. Yes, up and then down. Still no acceptance into the Olympics. As a consolation, at one point, Cosmetic company suggested they sell a red lipstick named for woman runner. Their offer was not accepted. Now this next slide shows Tarzan Brown, a Narragansett Indian. Wikipedia says it best. Tarzan Brown has, has taken off so fast at the start of the 1936 Boston Marathon that the press truck led the second runner, John A. A. John A. Kelly, until the 20 mile mark. When it was on this Newton Hill, that Kelly caught up to Tarzan. As Kelly overtook Tarzan, an, meeting, an, an amazing feat, giving the ste steady record breaking pace Tarzan had set, Kelly patted Tarzan on the back. 
What followed was a struggle between Tarzan, who took the lead on the downhills, and Kelly, who took the lead on the uphills, until finally Tarzan took the lead again to win the race, as Kelly faded to a fifth place finish. This struggle inspired reporter Jerry Nason to name the last Newton Hill, Heartbreak Hill, because Tarzan broke Kelly's heart there. Kelly eventually did run more than 60 Boston marathons, winning two. The Boston Marathon is held in April on Patriots Day, which commemorates Paul Revere's ride alerting the countryside that the British are coming. Efforts were made to have the race course along Revere's route, but proved impossible. In 1924, the permanent start was established in Hopkinton, Massachusetts almost due west of Boston. The course is run on a fairly narrow road, rolling slightly downhill for the first half. Mile 13 is known for its scream tunnel. Wellesley College students line the road with posters and scream as the runners fly by. Their exuberance can be heard a mile away. High fives and even some kisses are given. A fun mile then down to those Newton Hills. Next slide, please. Another page here somehow. Eventually, Bobby Gibb was rec recognized as the woman runner of Boston in 1966, 67, and 68. But it took subterfuge for Catherine Switzer to be the first woman to run with a number as an official entrant. Her application only had Kay Switzer as her name. She always signed her name that way. When it was recognized that a woman was running with a number, Horace, Jock Semple, a race official, jumped from the press truck and tried to, truck and tried to take, pull her number off. Catherine's boyfriend, a hammer thrower, dispensed with Semple. Despite Switzer running as a flagrant violation of the rules, she finished and has gone down in Boston Marathon history. Next slide, please. My Boston Marathon. But people who have known very little about marathons would ask me, have you run the Boston Marathon? Some of you may remember Jason Eckford. He asked if I was gonna run the Boston 100th. That sounded tempting, but one has to qualify for Boston by a specific time on a course that is certified to be the correct marathon length. The time depends on your age. I tried to qualify, but no luck. Then I was told about running for a charity. Many runners raise huge amount of money, amounts of money for various charities in races, millions in total. It turned out that the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute would give me a number if I raised $1,500 by June 15th. In fact, if I did not, the amount would be debited from my credit card. That's an incentive. Friends were most generous and I easily met the challenge. My brother who ran New York with me thought of me as a bit of a quitter. He arranged for each mile I completed I would raise $100. Success. Yes, 100 times 26. And the next slide, please. This will show Meb winning the Boston Marathon. The United States has many top marathoners. The man I will talk about is known as Meb, M-E-B. His young years I will later comp compare with Joan Benoit Samuelson's. His last name is Kevleski. Meb was born in Eritrea and escaped by way of Athens with his parents and siblings when he was 12. Growing up in Eritrea, he did attend school to which he, of course, ran. He did not own a book. In Eritrea, there were frequent wars. Life was not safe for a male. They would either be constricted into the army or killed. Usually there was little food or wood for cooking. At times, Meb fashioned a rough belt, climbed a tree, and then slipped down with the belt, scraping off the bark for fuel. 
During droughts, he will eat moist dirt for the nutrients in the moisture. No wonder Meb was a skinny kid with a bloated, bloated stomach. His family did have a cow or two and some crops, which they would sell. His mother walked a hundred miles round trip to sell her crops. Once during this trek, she was pregnant and during another carried an infant. Meanwhile, Meb's father escaped to the Sudan where he hoped to find a job, a dangerous 300 mile walk. Eventually he became a shopkeeper. He sent back money to the family and also saved so they could all come to America. Five years after leaving his family, they were reunited in Italy. With great persistence, the family recognized their dream of living in America. They arrived in 1987. Meb's family is truly remarkable. His, fam his parents firmly stressed faith, education, and exercise. His father had English lessons for his children at 4.30 a.m. and no sleeping in. All nine brothers and sisters are college graduates, seven with advanced degrees. After workouts, Meb would sit in an ice bath and read the Bible. The ice bath is used by many athletes to stop inflammations. My daughter, Merrily has a personal, personal story about Meb. While running in Boston, she was passed very rapidly by Meb. A great admirer of him, she questioned, Meb? He turned around and truly did run with her. They chatted a bit, and he asked if he might give her a bit of running advice. Of course. Advice given, they shook hands, and off he went. A thrill of a lifetime for Merrily. Meb's running ability was spotted was when he was in seventh grade in Eritrea. The kids had a fitness, fitness test which, for which they had to run one mile cross country. Little Meb ran the mile in five minutes and 20 seconds. The PE teacher, that's incredibly fast for a child. The PE teacher called the high school cross country coach and said, we have an Olympian here. That changed Meb's life forever. Meb held national titles while in high school and at UCLA. In 2002, he ran his first marathon. As my younger daughter said after running London, Meb said, never again. But he did, running at least 18 and winning the New York City Marathon and the Olympic trials in 2009. An Olympic an American champion. In 2013, the year after the bombing at the finish of the Boston Marathon, Olympian Meb won the race in two hours and eight minutes. He was 39, the first American to win the race in many years, and here he is finishing. Joan Benoit Samuelson is a close friend of Meb. In Maine, Joni has organized a 6.2 or 10K race in which many of the world's top runners compete. Meb and others run the race and also give to the community as they interact with their hosts. I will quote what Joni said about Meb in the foreword of his book, Running to Overcome. Meb's story has given and will continue to give countless immigrants and runners reasons and confidence to believe in their dreams while following their hearts. Now, if I can show it, Here's a picture of Joni and Meb uh, from her from his book, from her book. So now is the time to talk about Joni. We could have the next slide, please. Joni is 63 and racing well. Such a contrast to Meb's early life, and yet they were equally thoughtful, modest, caring people. Joni grew up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, which is just south of Portland. She is so admired in her town that there is a wonderful statue of her running in full stride. Joan had two older brothers and one younger. Their family circumstances were such that these very competitive kids could afford to ski on weekends. Their father had been in the famous 10th Mountain Division of Skiers in World War II. 
Joan loved flying down the slopes somewhat recklessly. She dreamed of skiing in the Olympics, but broke her leg when she was 14. She also loved field hockey and track at Bowdoin College in North Carolina State. But she really enjoyed the solitude of the long distance runner. Joni won the Boston Marathon in 1979, setting an American record, and four years later won again, beating Greta Waits and setting American and world records. Her time was two hours and 22 minutes. The Boston Marathon was postponed this, uh, in, or canceled in 2020. However, one could run Boston virtually in September. Runners contacted the Boston Athletic Association to provide proof of their times. They received credit and a finisher's packet. They were even allowed to run 26.2 miles on a treadmill, I can't imagine. Back to Joni in the Olympics. While on a training run just before the trials, a friend who was painting a house yelled, Joni, you are flying. She knew then she was ready. The Olympic dream might just be hers, but a few months before the Olympic trials, she had knee troubles. Good days and bad days followed. And finally, Joni had to have arthroscopic surgery just 17 days before the trials. Past performances are not considered for making the team. Only the first three finishers make the Olympic team and an alternate. To add to her motivation, it was to be the first Olympics with a women's marathon. That's 88 years since the start of the modern Olympic games with a men's marathon. Joni resumed training immediately after the surgery. In fact, the first day after which she pedaled a bicycle, which was suspended overhead. Joan ran brilliantly and won the trials. Remember, that is just 17 days after arthroscopic knee surgery. On to the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. As the race started, there was a tight pack of 50 women. They came from 28 countries. Joan was used to that freedom of running on the open roads in Maine. She skipped the first water stop to avoid the congestion and spurted ahead of the pack. The other women, including Greta Waits and the world's best marathoners, knew of her knee surgery, so just let her go. Their mistake. Joni ran alone the rest of the way and into the Olympic Stadium. She was so thrilled she leapt over the finish line beating Greta Waits by a minute. And these are two shots of her. <clears throat> well, here's her leaping over the finish line and the other one with her painter's hat on in the, during the race. Now, the next slide. While at, while at exhibits before the New York Marathon, uh, there she is getting crowned. All righty, glad you showed that. <laughs> I missed it. While at the exhibits before the New York Marathon, Riley, one of the four of us who trained together, picked up a flyer about the Helsinki Marathon. Matt, you'll see, there we are. That was in her hometown. She urged me to go to Helsinki, so tempting. I could finish, uh, visit my AFS, my, yeah, AFS, Finnish daughter and family, plus Riley's family. What an opportunity. Again, great fun. This was in 1983, and only 5% of the runners were women, particularly older women, looked us in the eye and said, Hoover, which means I think you are great. They were so pleased to see women running well. The race course was beautiful as it wound through Helsinki and the islands. As I was running the Helsinki Marathon, I suddenly realized I had no idea what the length was in kilometers. The distance was only given in kilometers. Not good. Happily, I learned I was near the end. Just then, a funny thing happened. I saw a man pushing a, his child in a homemade wagon. There was no way he should finish ahead of me. By sprinting to overtake him, I finished under four hours by 41 seconds worth the challenge. 
You probably are familiar with the names of two marathoners, not famous for their speed, but determination. Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Anthony Fauci. Yes, he approves of women running. Oprah ran the Marine Corps Marathon in four and a half hours, a very respectable time, and she never walked, even the last half mile, which is up a hill. The University of Virginia president, Jim Ryan, and his wife, Katie, qualify and run Boston annually. They are fast. The next slide, please. This shows Cynthia Lorenzoni. Also very fast is Cynthia Lorenzoni, who with her family owned the Ragged Mountain Running and Walking Shop here in Charlottesville. Cynthia won the huge Marine Corps Marathon twice. And the next slide again. A bit more about my running and stories of other marathons. Why run a marathon? Because it is there, as they used to say about climbing mountains. It's just a challenge that really is fairly easy to accomplish. Sounded like fun to one who likes to compete. All you need is a little bit of luck and motivation. A friend suggested she and I run the Richmond Marathon in 1981. We ran many training miles together, chatting away. I think the training schedule we used was from the Runner's World magazine. It stated if we were, if we were averaging about 25 miles a week, we could finish a marathon with 12 weeks of training. We were running at least that. Our longest training run would be 20 miles. Nowadays, people training would run at least 60 miles a week. But Margie and I stuck to the schedule and completed the race. Fortunately, Margie did not, quote, hit the wall. I did. But she encouraged me on to the finish. What is hitting the wall? The wall? At about 20 miles, you may have used up all your energy store of glycogen in your liver and muscles. Suddenly, you just feel drained and want to quit. Now runners run 20 miles and longer in training to accustom one's body to this depletion. The best marathoners can have ad averaged up to 135 miles a week, running twice a day, napping in between, and eating a lot of good food. Calorie intake is four to 5,000 calories a day. And now we go to slide, next slide with Sir Tom. I must mention a most admirable walker, the late Sir Thomas More. At age 20, then Captain Tom decided to walk the 82 foot lap of his garden at least 100 times using his walker. He hoped people would support him by donating money to the National Health Service. People in the media, media took, look, look, took note. His grand total raise was about 32 million British pounds. Even the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge contributed. Sir Tom was knighted by Queen Elizabeth, as you see here. He said he was absolutely overawed. As so many runners have done, he set a goal and finished in glorious style. Some of you listen, have listened to Linda Scandor's presentations. Linda presented two talks, one about walking on the trail between the 88 Japanese monasteries, a second talk about walking about 500 miles in France on the Camino. Stay tuned for her next talk. Linda has won, run 21 marathons qualifying for Boston often. And the next slide. This slide shows my daughter and me nearing the 13th mile mark in the Boston Marathon. This time she joined me, gave me socks, and encouraged me all the way to the finish. Could not have done it without her. Marilyn has run 13 marathons. She gave me a lot of advice on getting this talk ready. To finish, I quote Joyce Carol Oates, who said running, if there is any activity happier, more exhilarating, more nourishing to the imagination, I can't think what it might be. Thank you all. And thank you particularly Karen Merrick for your help getting this all set up. Wow, wow, um, that's amazing. Um, 
I'm all choked up. <laughs> I get that uh, way too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you all have any questions or comments, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, and um, Bev has given us some more time where we can ask her anything we would like. I did look up the fastest winning times in marathons now. Uh, 2006, well, no, wait a minute. The world record is 201, two hours and one minute. That's by a Kenyan. The American fastest time is two hours and six minutes. Those are for men. Women, two hours and 14 minutes. That's a Kenyan. The United States fastest woman has run it two hours and 20 minutes. So they, they remain faster than we. I think the training and altitude in their build is so slender. They just, they don't, you know, they weigh 90 pounds, the women. So it's amazing. So what, what are the uh, the oldest men and women that have completed the, the, the marathon? And what are the youngest that have competed? Youngest, I, I think, well, a little girl ran, won the Richmond Marathon one year, and she was about 13, I think. Hmm. In fact, they thought it was a boy until she took off her hoodie jacket. And uh, the oldest, I certainly have read of a, a lady, 92, winning, a uh, running a marathon. And uh, there was a, a nun who started running in her 60th year, and she went on into her 80s. and usually ran her, won her age group. <laughs> there weren't many in it, but she still won them. So impressive. Uh, how, did you, how did you take care of your, 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 you know, your joints, your muscles? I mean, did you do any, do any massage or anything while you're, you know, training and doing this? Did you do anything special? Uh, not really. I, I, was, I guess I'm kind of a lazy runner, so I never push too hard. Uh, my knees and hips are in pretty good shape. Uh, once in a while you have a little foot injury, but nothing mammoth at all. So, uh, and I haven't, I did a massage once after marathon it practically killed me. <laughs> it was so hard, I couldn't stand it. So I just don't do much. My daughter I know has a lot of massages and some acupuncture. She has an injury, a lot of physical therapy that hurt, that helps a lot. I know Linda's taken use physical therapy a lot, mm -hmm. so. Bev, what advice did Mev give to Marilee? Well, the same advice I had given her. Ah. She, she does not hold her arms up when she runs. She, they're really sort of at half mast. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, you know, pump your arms and you're gonna go faster, particularly up a hill. What's and her position now? Is she at right angles or is not she? Not at all. No, nope, she's doing the same old way. <laughs> I was running the uh, Boston, I mean, the uh, our 10 mile in one year. We're towards the finish, and Tony Holland's wife, Ann, came up to me and she said, I just, this is awful, these long hills. And I said, Well, pump your arms. I thought I was going to beat her. She pumped her arms and left me in their dust. <laughs> So it does help, <laughs> I'm certainly having them up a little bit. What kind of food have you found, uh, you know, most helpful when you're training to help your energy? And what, what is your, you know, what does your diet consist of? Any kind of special diet or anything? No, just, it gave me license to eat a little more food, but uh, nothing in particular. No, just, I think more, maybe more protein, uh, but that's what I liked anyway. So uh, but people have specialized diets now, uh, very specialized, so. You mentioned that Marilee had socks for you in the hundredth. Yes. Funny. Did you stop and change socks? Well, what did I do? Down low and take your shoes off. Oh, I sat down. Um, I mean, what could I do? My daughter brought them for me. She thought I needed them, so I put them on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could have bent. Oh, sure, you could have. <laughs> By the way, I'm wearing a Boston shirt in your I office. Noticed that. I noticed that. Great. They're so good. They're so attractive. Is that from what year? 19? No. Um, 2012. 2012. Yeah. 
Boston won hearts. It was in 1996, so a long while ago. How, how do you treat your 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 feet, and what, what do you put in socks and so on, so you don't get blisters over a long period of time? I just wore plain old socks. <laughs> I don't know what to <laughs> you. I mean, I, if you find a shot, sock that is comfortable and doesn't give you a blister, I I don't think I've hardly had one. Um, that's the one to wear. Uh, Mark and Cynthia's Ragged Mountain Shop has lots of really well-tested socks that are particularly comfortable and good. So you don't usually get a list of with them. May I share how we became friends, Bev? <laughs> we both worked out at ACAC, which is a gym in Charlottesville. And I walked up to her and introduced myself and simply said, I know that you run marathons. I've just begun running. Would you mind going out with me? And for years and years, we ran maybe three days a week. Something like that, yeah. Six o'clock in the morning and then on, um, on Sundays. But just as steadfast, I couldn't have asked for a better running mate. Well, thank you. But what I remember most is you said, do you think I could run a marathon? <laughs> I said, yes. And she's run 21 of them. So I was right. <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic achievement. Bev, you said that you've been here since 1957, but you started running in the in the 60s. Is that well, right? When women really weren't doing that? So how was that? Oh, well, it didn't bother me. <laughs> I just ran. Um, there were a few little races and I'd like that. And so I'd go in them. I usually won my age group because then nobody else was in them. <laughs> so, but, uh, you, you know, I've, in some places, well, the Helsinki, which was such fun. And uh, I've run in Philadelphia, which was great. And uh, the most unusual was running a half marathon in Williamsburg in February, I think one year. Mm. And it was cold and it snowed. Oh. It was, it was sponsored by Anna it was a Bush and they had, of course, beer when you finished, but also bouillon, which was so good. But uh, I was the winner in over 60. There was no woman over 60. And I can't give you the year of that. But again, they just weren't running. Hmm. Uh, two questions about inspiration. When you were very young and began running and, and decided you loved running, what, what, what inspired you to take up running? And, and secondly, uh, you know, what kept inspiring you? to train and run because, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to make those long runs and, and do it and, and do it day after day. Well, just uh, some men in the neighborhood were running and they said, you ought to run. And uh, then I saw these little races, I mean, little tiny races, I mean, three, a 5K. And so I went in those and because there were very few in my age or if no one, I could win them. I could my age group, <laughs> so and uh, I, so I just kept on running. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed running with friends like Linda and so on, and the uh, three others that we trained together for the uh, Richmond. Uh, no, for uh, New York. It's just the camaraderie. Then, as Wellesley graduate. Were you part of the screening women? I you... was, and I graduated, I, I graduated in 1956 from Wellesley. And I have a, well, I gave it to Mark. I, there was a photo I took of the runners going by in probably 1954, because they were all men. And there were just a smattering of them, 30 maybe. And there was a bus driving with them, but the, we were out there cheering them on. Or just I would, runners. Pardon me? Just 30 runners? They were probably spread out behind, but the pack was just, they were sort of all over the road and uh, there weren't all that many. Um, I don't know that, there must have been some women out there cheering or I wouldn't have known to go out because I don't know why I bought it, but I'm glad I did. Did you? At seeing them, did you sort of wish or picture yourself doing the same thing? Never gave it a thought. No. 
I'm, I'm curious in, in, you know, in your home, do you have a, a display of, uh, you know, all your running numbers and your running t-shirts and all the places you've been? Uh... Um, I had them until we moved and I had to downsize and I threw them away. Oh. All my times, <laughs> which was probably a good idea. Yeah. That, uh, it was just, it was fun. I have the good memories. So, and people had done much better than I. So, but anyway, have you run? Do you I, run? I, I did. And, and quite frankly, it just bothers my knees too much now. Oh, dear. That's too yeah, bad. So I, I just, you know, I ran for years and years and years and, and just, I just can't do it anymore. Well, I ran until I think 2008. Mm. After second or nine, I had back surgery a couple of times. Mm. And after the second one, the doctor said, you would have had it sooner, the surgery sooner, had you not been a runner. Mm. But now's the time to stop. So, because the back's sort of a mess. But anyway, um, that was interesting because most of my friends said, well, you shouldn't have been running. That's what, what's wrong with your back. You know, not at all. So I'm sorry your knees hurt. So what do you do post-2008 uh, post then? The, you know, <laughs> I mean, running was so much, it sounds like you were doing it for, what, 50 years? <laughs> well, not quite. <laughs> um, well, I work out. I have a trainer. I go to a couple of times a week. I walk not this big distances, but I've, I walked Joni's race that I mentioned uh, that she has in, in uh, Cape Elizabeth. I've walked that a few times, which is, it's just a great celebration. It's a beautiful race along the coast of Maine, hard to beat. So in fact, Linda came up and ran it with me once or she, at the same time, she finished much ahead of me, but she came up. So um, I just keep active and I've been lucky that I can. Might I say that Bev is still involved in the running world. She's one of our, of our best volunteers. She, you know, you depend upon people to call your splits or to meet you at the finish line or to close off traffic at different junctions. And Bev all, gives a lot of her time so that a lot of us can run. Well, and, the track club has given a lot to me. So, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, with any injury, if I had a problem with a knee or something, I'd go and talk with Mark. And uh, maybe it was my old shoes or something. So uh, that that store is a great, great um, bonus to have. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Wow. If I, if I may ask, uh, Linda, what is your cat's name? I'm just loving seeing your cat. <laughs> blanket. She just insisted on getting there. I've got two. They look just alike. Lily and Juju. Lily is much more the lap cat. Here's her little face right there. <laughs> Lily, look at Tom. <laughs> oh, and, and they're just a, a complete joy for me. Um, yeah, they, they just... They're lovely, and they, they just love being with me the whole time. Mm. So, <laughs> Bev, before before you we go, I, I just want to ask you what what was it like, you know, to run with your daughter? I know you mentioned a little bit, but I mean, is that was that a a very premeditated? I mean, did you guys rehear, uh, rehearse? What do you call it? Practice ahead of time together, or you no? Know, she just joined me, and we ran together, which was great because. I was not well trained. Mm. I just didn't do a good job at the training. And she'd say, okay, you can make it to that next telephone pole. All <laughs> right, you can see the Sitco sign. That means a mile to go. And there's the Prudential building. That's the end. You can do it. <laughs> so she was a huge help. So, and it was fun to run with it. It's something we have very special. Yeah, that must have been really special. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah with both of her daughters, Kim and Marilyn. They both run and she's on top of it. She knows when the race is, how the practice is going, what injuries they, they both have, but, it, but it's a really nice way of sharing yeah. uh, something they do actively. And the fact that you bring such expertise. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I don't think of you as one of those overly assaulted, assertive, bold women that they were, the men were complaining was going to happen. I think you just, <laughs> that's Tony just, when she finished the New York, Mar I mean, the uh, Olympic marathon. I don't know what she weighs, 110 maybe. No, she probably doesn't. That. And uh, she's a little tiny thing. <laughs> Talk about the blueberry soup at Helsinki. Pardon me? Blueberry soup at Helsinki. Oh, yes. Towards the end, my host family was out there with a carton of blueberry soup, which they offered me a drink of. And of course, I had to accept it. They said all the cross country skiers use this for energy. And so I had some, and I thought this may kill me. Um, whether it made a difference, I don't know, but it was very nice of them to come out and mm. give me a boost. So it's a beautiful well, city. Well, I learned a lot about the history of marathons and um, some inspiring people. Thank you so much for all of that as well, you know, including yourself and Linda. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's very nice. That's yeah. a lovely spot. I'm just so impressed with the center. Yeah, we love it here. And um, thanks again for coming. And we'll, I'm recording this, so we'll put it up on our website too. So if you have friends and family who you'd like to have, share with this, please do. Thank you. Um, just check on our YouTube website. Okay.